Good evening, this is TCN English News Edition, and you're watching with me, Ninghoi Kim Kong Sai. First, the headlines. 15,425 houses damaged in Sunday's hailstorm. Rupees 6.90 crore released from SDRF as immediate relief fund, says CM. Storms and hails damaged thousands of houses in northeastern India. News in detail. Manipur Chief Minister N. Biran Singh stated that deputy commissioners are assessing the damage caused by the hailstorm. Around 15,425 properties are severely damaged and one person has died. He mentioned that the center has released rupees 6.9 crore to assist the state with more funds likely to come. Speaking to media persons, he said, we are assessing the total damage, including to houses, livestock, and agriculture. We will provide compensations, be run aided, under SDRF. We have sanctioned rupees 6.9 crore. We have started providing essential commodities and CZI. Major damage has occurred in Imphal East and West, Bishnupur, Taubal, and Charajampur. We have opened 42 relief camps. The Chief Minister noted a significant surge in demand for CZI seats and efforts are underway to make them available. DA Skiran Kumar, Deputy Commissioner of Imphal West District, issued an order stating, Whereas the hailstorm that occurred on 5th May 2024 has caused extensive damage to properties, including houses in the district, and there has been a sudden rise in demand for roofing materials, including CZI roofing. Whereas deputy commissioners in the state have been author authorized to monitor the prices of roofing materials, including CZI siege, to ensure availability at reasonable range. Now, therefore, considering the urgent need for proper rationalizations of all available roofing materials in the district and ensuring that they reach all genuinely affected family members, the following regulations are hereby made and shall come into effect immediately for one week. That is from May 6, 2024 to 13 May 2024. All wholesalers, retailers, and shops of any nomenclature shall remain open on all days, including holidays and Sundays. The rates of 30 April 2024 or lower rates, uh, whatever possible, shall be used as the market rate or price of the mar material. No bulk purchase, including by private parties, shall be allowed in any of the centers or shops or establishments. All sales shall be only for the health term affected families and details of the sales are to be indicated in the records of the establishment. The massive rain, wind and hail storm on Sunday destroyed over 10 houses across Mizoram. Over 500 houses destroyed since May 2, 2024. According to the reports received by the Disaster Management and Rehabilitation Control Room, a house was reported damaged at Aizol's Saranveng locality, which was damaged by a fallen tree. At Lunglei district, nine villages and localities reported house damages, landslide, and collapse of a brass wall. Korot village of Tampai district reported a house damaged by hailstorm, while Kuanting village had a house damaged by windstorm. Furthermore, Monday also witnessed cloud bursts accompanied with strong winds across the state and hailstorm in some districts. Detailed reports of houses and property destroyed are yet to be finalized by the Disaster Management and Rehabilitation Department. Over 480 houses were damaged in the rains and thunderstorms that battered Meghalaya, Disaster Management Minister. Kirman Sila said on Monday. Sila said 483 houses, two schools, and one church was damaged in the disaster, which affected 949 people across the state. The rains, accompanied by strong winds, began on Sunday and were continuing in several parts of the state on Monday as well. 
The minister says seven of the state's 12 districts were affected by the disaster, with East Town West Kasi Hills being the worst hit. Steps are being taken by all deputy commissioners and BDOs so that the people can get some relief, Sila said. He said assessments were being made in all districts and blocks to gauge the extent of the damage. Chief Minister Conrad K. Sangma said the district administrations is working on a war footing to provide relief to the affected people. Due to strong winds and heavy rains in some part of the state, many houses have been damaged. Have asked the administrations to immediately provide relief, he posted on X. The Gospel Ministry for Disabilities of India, ZMFDI, a home for disabilities and a place where God's voice calls and guides his people, experiences God's Holy Spirit revelations today again. ZMFDI had numerous times experienced the Holy Spirit's visit since April last year. Today, the Holy Spirit visited the place again where it delivered God's message to the cookies of people. The Holy Spirit has been warning the cookies of people against tragic incidents that can be befall the whole community. It had done many miraculous works for the people like curing diseases, exorcism, and revelations. The Holy Spirit tells the people about the end times coming soon. Thousands of believers attended today's Holy Spirit visit to accept and learn the ways of God. Men some may be mad that GMFDI is run by Evangelist Tim Kulam and Evangelist Tang Linse. And God uses Robert for the Holy Spirit to deliver his message. Believers have been increasing tremendously and already overcrowding the ZMFDI home. เฮียนอีจิตนาโคอีจันปีจาลดิวฮัมนอฮอนะจีนาวจุกยากูนฮัมเววินนะลุจางซุงวานะซัมซังโออุมจัดเฮคันโลนอฮอเดียเกมาน
MSRLM, clarifications of self-help groups, and village level federations, skills training, and introductions of CLF concepts respectively. The program was attended by VLF cadres and LAMCA block trainers respectively. Coming to national news. Amid the ongoing political slugfest, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has urged the Muslim community to introspect and think about the future, saying he was neither against Muslims nor Islam. The Prime Minister made the comments while speaking to Times Now amid a war of words between the Bharatiya Zanata Party BJP, and opposition leaders over his infiltrators remarked that he made at an elections rally in Rajasthan on April 22, allegedly referring to the Muslim community. Modi shared clippings of his TV interviews on his ex formerly Twitter handled on Tuesday, May 7, in which he commented on various issues. Neither we are against Muslim nor Islam. This is not our work. Muslim community understands everything. When I end the traditions of triple talaq, when I give a Yushman Kurt or when I give COVID vaccine, Muslim sister feels I am a genuine man who does not discriminate, said Modi. Accusing Congress of thriving on creating a feeling of persistent fear and insecurity among the minorities of India. On questions about accusations of Modi being against Muslims and Hindu Muslims being done during the elections, Modi said, When there was the government of Atal Bihari Vajpayee, our manifesto mentioned Ram Mandir, Article 370. When you speak about 100%, every community is included. There is a guarantee of social justice, secularism. Modi ensures that everyone gets everything. Father Modi also asked the Muslim Samas community and their educated members to introspect. The country is moving forward. If your community is lagging, then what is the reason? Did you receive the benefit of government schemes during Congress rule? If you keep thinking about who to put in power and who to remove, you will only ruin the future of your children. The Muslim community is changing across the world, aided Modi. Think about your future. I don't want any community to live the life of bonded labor due to an atmosphere of fear. The Prime Minister asked the Muslim community. The Prime Minister also attacked Congress, accusing them of not respecting the Constitution, stating that those who disrespect it have no right to say anything. He said, so that we create a spirit of constitutions in the country. It is not that the constitution should be only for judges and lawyers. When I brought the proposals in parliament to celebrate the constitution's day, Kirk Z, Congress chief, himself opposed it, saying what was the need when we celebrate 26 January. During the initial six hours of polling in the third phase of Lok Sabha elections across 93 constituencies in 11 states, and Union Territory on May 7, the voter turnout reached approximately 40%. However, incidents of violence were reported in West Bengal and some villages in Uttar Pradesh witnessed pool boycotts. Maharashtra had the lowest voting percentage at 31.55%, while West Bengal recorded the highest with at most 50% turnout. Notably, the BJP secured victory in the Surat constituency in Gujarat unopposed. The face shows, this face show, the conclusions of voting in Goa, two seats, Gujarat, 25 seats, Chhattisgarh, 7 seats, and Karnataka, 14 seats. Additionally, voting took place for two Lok Sabha seats in Dadra and Nagar Haveli and Daman and Du. The remaining constituencies up for voting included four seats in Assam, five in Bihar, eight in Madhya Pradesh, 11 in Maharashtra. 10 in Uttar Pradesh and 4 in West Bengal. The polling depth for the Anandak Rajori Lok Sabha seat in Jammu and Kashmir was rescheduled to May 25 for Fast 6. Key candidates in this fast include Amit Sa, BZP from Gandhinagar, Gujarat, Digvijaya Singh Congress from Rajgarh, 
Madhya Pradesh, Shivraj Singh Chauhan, BJP from Vidisha, Madhya Pradesh, Dimple Yadav, Samaswadi Party from Manipuri, Uttar Pradesh, Supriya Sule, Nationalist Congress Party, Sarat Power from Baramati, Maharashtra, Pushotam Rupala, BJP from Rajkot, Gujarat, Zyoti Radita, Skindia BJP from Guna, Madhya Pradesh, Prahla Josi BJP from Darwat, Karnataka, and K.S. Eswarappa BJP from Simoga, Karnataka. My dear brothers and sisters, youth unemployment, crimes against women, and discrimination against Dalits, Adivasis, and minorities have all reached unprecedented levels. These challenges stem from the niyat or niti of Prime Minister Modi and the BJP, which aim for power, rejecting inclusivity and dialogue. The sight of constitution of our constitution and democracy under threat are poor being left behind and the fabric of our society being torn apart fills me with anguish. Today, I ask for your support once again. Our Nyaya Patra and guarantees aim to unite our nation and work for the poor, youth, women, farmers, workers, and disadvantaged communities of India. The Congress and the India parties are committed to defend our constitution and democracy. Reject the proponents of lies and hatred and vote for the Congress for a brighter and more equal future for all. Press the hand button and together let us build a stronger, more united India with peace and harmony for all. Dhanyavad. Jai. The Coast Guard detained an Iranian fishing vessel with six fishermen from Kanyakumari on board, west of Bayport in North Kerala on Sunday. The vessel was subsequently brought to Kochi, and the fishermen, namely Kavis Kumar, 24 years, Niyat Hayalan, 31, Maria Daniel, 38, Muniz Warren, 37, Arun Tayalan, 28, and Razendran, 36, were handed over to the coastal police at Fort Kochi. According to the Coast Guard, the boat was owned by an Iranian sponsor named Sid Sot Ansari. He had contracted the Indian fishermen by issuing them Iranian visas for fishing off the coast of Iran in his boat since March 26, 2023. The fishermen alleged that the sponsor had ill-treated them and had not provided them basic living conditions. They also say that their passports were all taken away by him. This forced them to escape from Iran to India using the same boat. But when the Coast Guard intercepted the boat in a coordinated air-sea operations, the crew members were in distress without food and other essential supplies. They were provided relief. The crew told the coastal police that they had left Iran on April 22 and reached the coast the coast of Kerala late on Sunday. They were interrogated by various security agencies before being handed over to the coastal police. According to a source, the fishermen say they had left India on valid visa, but were without their passport now after they were confiscated by their sponsor. The legal process said an official involved producing them for immigration's clearance to record their entry to India. They would also be subjected to a medical examination. The Coast Guard say, the detentions of the foreign fishing boat with India crew highlighted the complexities of maritime security and the challenges being faced by any maritime law enforcement agencies in preventing illegal activities at sea. This incident underscores the Indian Coast Guard's ongoing efforts to safeguard India's maritime borders and maintain law and order in maritime zones of India, it said. The Coast Guard maintained a high level of security during the operations. The boat was boarded by the Coast Guard boarding team, which checked if it was involved in any anti-national activity.
Coming to international news. A Russian drone attack cut power to more than four lakh consumers in parts of Ukraine's northeast region of Sumy, official state on Monday, after Kyiv said its air defense force downed 12 attack drones in the region overnight. Walk to restore electricity continued into the morning as 91 settlements out of the 1,325 impacted remain without power in the region. National grid operator Ukraine Argo said on Telegram messaging app. Electricity supply has been restored in the affected settlements and parts of the city of the Sumy, the region's military administration said on Telegram. Ukraine's Air Force says that Russia launched 13 attack drones against Ukraine. Air defense systems downed 12 of the air weapons over the Sumy region. Russia's recent massive drone and missile attacks have increasingly been aimed at Ukraine's energy system, leading to blackouts in many regions and significant damage to its thermal and hydropower stations. These attacks cost more than $1 billion worth of damage to the sector. Ukraine's Energy Minister Zerman Galushchenko said on Sunday. As the country races to repair its stations ahead of the winter, it has turned to solar and wind power generations, in addition to imports from Europe for support. Reuters could not independently verify the reports. There was no immediate command from Russia, which have been pummeling Ukraine's east and south regions with drones and missiles throughout the war. The head of the United Nations World Food Program says Northern Gaza has entered full-blown famine after nearly seven months of war between Israel and Hamas. But a formal and highly sensitive famine declaration faces the complications of politics and of confirming how many people have died. Cindy M. C. Kent in an NBC interview broadcast Sunday said severe Israeli restrictions on humanitarian deliveries to the territories that had long relied on outside food assistance have put civilians in the most isolated, devastated part of Gaza over the brink. Femine was now moving south in Gaza, she said. A WFP spokesman later told that Associated Press that one of the three benchmarks for a formal Femine declaration had already been met in northern Gaza, and another is nearly met. Important details on how far the effort to document deadly hunger has progressed. Israel faces mounting pressure from top Ailey, the United States and others to let more aid into Gaza, notably by opening more land crossing for the most efficient delivery by truck, aid groups, says deliveries by air and sea by the United States and other countries cannot meet the needs of Gaza's 2.3 million people. A growing number of them reaching the stage of malnutrition where a child's growth is stunted, and that's occurred. Famine had been projected in parts of Gaza this month in a March report by the Integrated Food Security Fast Classification, a global initiative that includes WFP as a partner. It nearly is said nearly a third of Gaza's population was experiencing the highest level of catastrophic hunger and that could rise to nearly half by July. The next IPC report is expected in July. Israel strongly rejects any claims of a mind in Gaza, and its humanitarian agency called MC Kane's assassin incorrect. A formal declaration could be used as evidence at the International Criminal Court as well as the International Court of Justice where Israel faces allegations of genocide in a case brought by South Africa. Here's what we know about famine and the hunger crisis in Gaza. Hamas said on Monday it accepted an Egyptian Qatari ceasefire proposal, but Israel said the deal did not meet its core demands and it was pushing ahead with an assault on the southern Gaza city of Rafah. Still, Israel said it would continue negotiations. The high-stakes diplomatic moves and military brinkmanship left a glimmer of hope alive, but only barely. For an accord that could bring at least a post in the seven-month-old war that has devastated the Gaza Strip. 
Hanging over the wrangler was the threat of an all-out Israeli assault on Rafah, a move the United States strongly opposes, and that aid groups were will be disastrous for some 1.4 million Palestinians taking refuge there. Hamas abrupt acceptance of the ceasefire deal came hours after Israel ordered an evacuation of some one lakh Palestinians from its town neighborhoods of Rafah, signaling an invasion of imminent. The Israeli military said it was conducting targeted strikes against Hamas in Istan Rafah. Soon after, Israeli tanks enter Rafah, reaching as close as 200 meters yards from Rafah's crossing with neighboring Egypt, a Palestinian security officer and an Egyptian officer said. Both spoke on conditions of anonymity because they were not authorized to talk to the media. The reported incursions came a day after Hamas militants killed four Israeli soldiers in a mortar attack that Israel said originated near the Arafah crossing. The Egyptian officials said the operations appear to be limited. The Associated Press could not independently verify the scope of the operations. Israeli airstrikes also hit elsewhere in Rafah late Monday, killing at least five people, including a child and a woman. Hospital officials said. Shortly after Hamas said it had accepted the Egyptian Qatari truce proposals, Israel's war cabinet decided to continue the Rafah operations. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu office said. It also said that while the proposal Hamas agreed to is far from meeting Israel's core demands, it would send negotiators to Egypt to work on a deal. Late Monday, Qatar announced it was sending a team of Egypt as well. President Joe Biden spoke with Netanyahu and reiterated U.S. concerns about an invasion of Rafah. U.S. State Department sp spokesman Matthew Miller said American officials were reviewing the Hamas response and discussing it with our partners in the region. It was not immediately known if the proposal Hamas agreed to was substantially different from one that U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken pressed the militant group to accept last week, which Blinken said included significant Israeli concessions. An American official said the U.S. was examining whether what Hamas agreed to was the version signed off owned by Israel and international negotiators or something else. Egyptian officials said the proposal called for a ceasefire of multiple stages, starting with a limited hostage release and partial Israeli troop pullbacks within Gaza. The two sides would also negotiate a permanent calm that would lead to a full hostage release and greater Israeli withdrawal out of the territory, they said. Hamas sought clearer guarantees for its key demands of an end to the war and complete Israeli withdrawal in return for the release of all hostages, but it wasn't clear if any changes were made. Israeli leaders have repeatedly rejected the threat of vowing to keep up their campaign until Hamas is destroyed after its October 7 attack on Israel that triggered the war. That's all from us tonight and we thank you for joining our program.